but I also didn't expect Dalton Kincaid to fall that that far in the first round. So uh, he's exciting because, you know, you heard Bean talk about Cole Beasley, and it's funny because mm -hmm. for weeks we were saying, hey, we need someone to control the middle of the field. We, we, we need dependable receivers because there's so many drops and interceptions over the middle of the field. Josh became gun shy throwing over the middle because of all those things. And we were thinking about it from a slot receiver standpoint. We weren't thinking about it from a tight end standpoint. And so they went out and got a guy that can be that high volume, maybe not all in year one, but he mm -hmm. can be in the future, you know, years two to three and beyond. He can be that high volume, efficient chain mover that Cole Beasley was the guy that Josh Allen leans on when, you know, he's looking at a different receiver as his primary target. That guy's not open. Second guy in that progression is not open. Okay. You know, I got to get rid of the ball late in the play. Find Dalton Kincaid instead of Cole Beasley. So mm -hmm. he's that type of guy, which is really exciting. He can be, again, in a few years, he can be that guy that soaks up a lot of those targets. I think that Cole Beasley did for this offense when the offense was at its best. You nailed it. When when this offense was at its best, it had an effective slot receiver in Cole Beasley. I mean, he got an all pro vote for just being exclusively a slot receiver, something you do not see. And his his ability to win versus man and zone and be able to see things quickly and accurately and on the same plane with Josh mm -hmm. Allen. He was, you know, Diggs was Allen's go-to guy, but Beasley was a significant, significant part of this offense and arguably Josh's biggest safety net and biggest like security blanket was Cole Beasley just knowing that, okay, you know what? It's third and whatever Cole's going to win and he could win in a variety of ways and kind of do whatever. And you get Dalton Kincaid who, is a tight end, but for all intents and purposes, I love that comment. I Roadhouse is one of my favorite movies yes, ever, so, so that's absolutely fantastic. Um, for those listening on audio only, the comment uh, was Dalton Roadhouse Kincaid, so I think that's absolutely fantastic. And with Kincaid, you get someone who is a tight end, but is really in the mold and vein of almost like a power slot receiver, and mm -hmm. he's extremely effective in the slot there were 77 players in 2022 that had at least 50 targets in the slot. And this is, could be anybody. It could be wide receiver, tight end, running back, whoever. 77 players in 2022 that had at least 50 targets in the slot. Kincaid was third in EPA per target. He was 10th in total EPA. He was first in positive play percentage. He was fifth in yards per route run. He was fifth in yards per target. He was fourth in first down percentage, and he was ninth in broken tackles plus missed tackles forced per reception. You mm. are getting someone who can function out of the slot underneath in the intermediate going vertically and going up the seam. He's got a large catch radius. He's reliable with his hands. Eric, you've talked consistently about, you know, his ability to kind of function in those Y option type looks. He's yeah. just a really smart processor. He's good pre to post snap with recognition and reading. And then you add in the physical tools and traits and it's understandable why the bills went up and got him because he gives them another body <clears throat> in the mold, in the vein of Cole Beasley with that idea in terms of controlling the middle, but obviously a much bigger body, a much bigger frame. And then that comes with the idea of potentially dictating the defenses. And as you put them in a bind with having to match your, your 12 personnel quote unquote, but trying to do it with your nickel corner or a third linebacker or a third safety, and then playing all the mismatch games that come with it. Yeah. And you know, Roy Collins says, but he is a rookie and that's true. That is true. And the tight end position is one that takes some time to develop the, what I would say to that is they're not going to ask him to be a full-time tight end. That's the thing. They have Dawson Knox. And so they can, if they want to do a lot more 12 personnel, which you can only go up because they were one of the worst, if not the worst, I think 32nd overall, right? And 4.1%, yeah, I think yeah, is how super, often super they were in 12 personnel last year. So it can only go up. And so they're going to ask him to be that move tight end. And, you know, as Anthony was talking about with all those stats, he was in this in the slot 48.8% of the time in his career, 55% last season. And so his, his, what I like about him, obviously his size is very good, but his movement, it just very, it's hard to really kind of dictate and, and let people know what it, it looks like, but it's very, it, he, you can tell he played basketball, right? Mm -hmm. The movement, it's smooth. His body control is smooth insane spatial awareness which is why he's so money against zone coverages and then he's got but he's still got that 
that like twitchiness, that reactive athleticism that basketball mm-hmm. players have when, hey, they're boxing someone out. Oh, now they're going to go up quickly for a rebound. Like he has that that twitchiness to him when he wants to show it. But he only shows it at those break points when he creates that separation. And so uh, he's really good. At, as you said, man, zone, he wins in both ways. Um and he's that chain mover, just like Cole Beasley. Someone said the third and medium go to Beasley. Like he's that type yeah. of guy. Think, listen to these stats on 74.5% of his receptions from the slot over the last two years, he converted them into a first down or a touchdown 74.5%. That's, That's number ridiculous. one among tight ends and receivers in this class. So among wide receivers and tight ends, he turned first downs and touchdowns out of his receptions from the slot. Like that is you can't you can't really replicate that. I mean, he's beating a lot of these wide receivers in this draft from the slot, and he's just keeping those chains moving. And that's why I'm excited about him. Maybe it doesn't happen on year one, mm-hmm. but a, a lot of these skills we're going to talk about and we're going to show you on the film. They translate. They translate uh, on Sunday. It's just how often you know they're able to get him the ball because when you do get him the ball, he catches it. He doesn't drop anything. He's got like a 1.6 drop rate. 1.6% drop rate, two drops on 165 targets. And we talked about the middle of the field, man. Like this is the type of guy Josh Allen needs. And he's basically like Cole Beasley he plays that role. Right. Mm. And Beasley actually was a really good receiver. As far as, you know, drops go, he didn't drop many balls, no. but he's, this guy's bigger and, you know, and he can, he has a catch radius over the middle. It's a different element that this offense hasn't had. Yeah, you don't have to put, you know, then this isn't a knock against Beasley, but if you're Josh Allen, you kind of got to put the ball on Cole Beasley. With Dalton Kincaid, like you just need to get it within his frame because he's six foot four and has that large catch radius. And Eric, you brought up the basketball point, which is something I really, really love. And he talked about it. That basketball background is what he credits for his ability to go up and pluck the football and like snatch it and bring it down and tuck it like a big man down low going and grabbing a rebound off the glass. And you see him, he attacks the ball, he high points it, he brings it down. And that's regardless if he's running a slot fade or he's by the sideline or if he's in a high traffic area in the middle of the field. He goes up, he gets it, he has the frame to go up and get it and withstand contact or box out guys and be physical combined with the technicality and smooth athleticism. It's a really intriguing player and skill set to add to this Buffalo bills yeah. offense and to, to Ken Dorsey. Yeah. And so keep in mind, guys, these plays that we're going to show you uh, some from 2021, some from 2022, we're going to try to, we're going to keep drawing these comparisons. Cause I want you guys to understand that. Yes. The you know, philosophically, the offense is going to change a little bit because it's going to change. They're going to use more, you know, multiple tight end sets. So that's the change, though. But as far as like what type of concepts that the Bills are going to have to run, they're going to run all the same stuff. It's just instead of maybe a shifty, um, you know, snappy slot guy, it'll be a bigger, you know, route running mm-hmm. tight end like Don Kin- Kincaid and even, you know, Dawson Knox. Obviously, I think he's also going to be running some of this stuff too. And so some of these plays that you're going to see here, the Bills already have in their their playbook, much like this play. This is a two by two formation. This is slot option, and this is what Utah did a bunch. They would put him in the slot to the short side of the field. All right, and I'll tell you why here in a little bit. But watch this; it's just the same movement. He's just running an option route. He's reading this guy dropping out, and this guy right here dropping out, and he's like, "Okay, I'm just going to pivot away from him." But just like Beasley used to do, rather than running this as an out route he does that little pivot away from the hook to curl defender because a lot of teams running these cover two type looks are mm-hmm. trapping with their corners. So he just pivots away. And I love, this is why he is so good after the catch. Look how he rotates his body as he's looking the ball in. He's already preparing to transition into a runner. It's something that you and I always talk about mm-hmm. a wide receiver's ability to transition into a runner and how quickly he does that, or even a running back for that matter, out of the backfield really sets a tone for how well they are after the catch. I think it's part of the reason why he's, you know, in addition to his athleticism, it's, it's part of the reason why he's able to generate yards after catch and why, um, you know, like I mentioned out of those 77 qualifying slot receivers with 50 targets, he was ninth in broken tackles plus missed tackles forced per reception. He, he transitions so quickly and smoothly from receiver to ball carrier. You see it consistently, like his body position, like he, he looks, he's looking the ball in with his eyes and his hands while the rest of his body is positioning himself to get up field. 
Like he's getting vertical already to go north and south while he's still looking in the ball. He's not taking his eyes off the ball. It's all one seamless, smooth transition from snap to read to settle to catch to ball carrier all in almost the blink of an eye, how fluid he is when he does that. And, you know, I, I love the piece that you mentioned with, you know, what, what the 12 personnel means just because you're in 12 personnel doesn't mean you necessarily have to be running like 12 personnel formations. It doesn't mean you're going to have, you know, both tight ends attached to the line of scrimmage or one in line and one hipped off. You can run your 11 personnel package out of quote unquote 12 personnel. If Dalton Kincaid is your slot receiver, because Eric, he can function and yeah. live in this kind of world with quickness and efficiency mentally and physically. Yeah, no doubt about it, man. Here's another one, two by two set. This is the end of the game. Um, I think it's fourth down and 10 here, 520 left in the game. They're down 14 to three. So this is a money down. This is a, a got to have it moment. And in that got to have it moment from the near hash, they're going to Kincaid from the slot. And he, what is he doing? He's running that slot option. He's getting into the body of that defender. You see him create that separation at the top. And again, working back to the ball, being QB friendly. Look at mm-hmm. his hands lead him back to the ball. His hands lead him back to the ball. He catches it, looks it in, and then he slips the tackle right here and gets the first down. These are the type of plays you got to have from your premier players, from your first round tight end in those big moments, fourth and 10, create that separation, work back to the ball, be QB friendly first down. Not only does he make the catch, but he catches it short of the sticks. And then, like you said, he has to work to get back up field and get the first down that, that takes tremendous faith in a quarterback to throw the ball short of the sticks because you have faith that your guy is going to beat the one guy that's covering him. And again, this is where you see some of that strength mixed in with that athleticism. And part of that is because the guys he's going to get matched up against because he's in the slot. He has the opportunity to get matched up against slot corners or safeties. Either way, players that probably aren't as big as him, or even if it's a more coverage based linebacker, it's doubtful that that coverage based linebacker is going to be 246 pounds like Dalton Kincaid is. So you have that mismatch potential from a size and frame standpoint, but also from an athleticism in the open field standpoint, like you see there, like it's hard to bring him down because he's got the size and the frame plus the athleticism. And then again, just the, even the knowledge and the awareness too to get up field enough. He knows where the sticks are. He grinds it out and he gets the first down. That's a really big play in a clutch moment for a game Utah needed. Yeah, and this was obviously his best game as a pro. And when I watched it, I said, wow, this is one of the better games I've seen in a couple of years, especially for talking from a receiver option, tight end, wide receiver. Uh, again, in the slot. And this is the thing. He's always, even when he's kind of in line, this has not been quite in line. Yep. Even when he's in line, they used him in a two-point stance more times than not. Um, and he just, right here, this might be my favorite play from him because, as you can see, this is just sticks. That means most of these receivers are getting to the sticks and turning and showing their numbers and the quarterback's throwing it. So normally this is like, hey, just hook it up in between these two defenders right here. I want you to watch what he does, though. Again, sets himself up. Look at him already turning upfield. He's working upfield as he's catching the ball and transitioning into a runner. This is how he's able to split those two guys right there and get upfield for the first down. This, again, this might be my favorite play because this is understanding – this is that spatial awareness, right, Mm -hmm. between those two defenders – and how he is transitioning from a receiver catching the ball and into a runner. And it's so smooth, man. It's so smooth. And it's the type of stuff you can't teach type of this type of smoothness, man. He's just, it's just so much fun to watch. And, but again, one of those things you have to see it because he's that good. He just makes it look so easy. That's the type of play and transition like upfield that you see in like drills that get you excited to be like, Oh wow, this guy like looks fluid and good. Like, let's see if he can do it in a game. But here he is pulling it off in a big game and he splits two big linebackers. Like he breaks the tackle of two linebackers. He pinballs off of both of them. And it's because he transitions so quickly. Like he beats them to the spot. Like they're still kind of reading and reacting. Look at the angles. They both yeah. take, especially 53, when he he hits it, the, the top of his drop, he starts coming forward, and he starts coming forward on that angle, but he's already lost because Kin- Kincaid is already getting upfield. And yeah. then 44 doesn't have the speed or the quickness to chase him down, and you end up just getting two shoulder tackles. And because Kincaid has some good contact balance and some functional strength, he's able to bounce off both of those shoulder tackles. This is... 
this is just, again, a really exciting piece because it, it, it showcases, again, the mental ability, his ability to kind of read what's going on, boom, settle. But then it shows that smooth, fluid athleticism combined with some physicality. I, I think, Eric, I think when you get a tight end that's known as like a receiving tight end, I think people associate with that with being like kind of softer or more finesse. And while he does have some finesse aspects to his game, he has more of a physical presence, I think, than he gets credit for, both as a blocker, even though he's not the best, and as a ball carrier and yards after catch guy. Yeah, no doubt, man. And so we talk about 12 personnel and the different formational alignments and fun you can have with a guy mm -hmm. like this. Um, this is why it's so exciting. So now instead of having him in a two by two, they have a two by two, but both the tight ends are on the line of scrimmage. Uh, Kincaid is circled the other tight ends right here. And so when you're, you have two tight ends in the game and you're in these two by two sets with your tight ends in line, the defense has to bring up guys. They have to bring up guys. Why Anthony? Cause they have to cover every single gap. And so a lot of times when you're running these two tight end sets, you get a stacked box, but more importantly, you get these single high sets. Yeah. And so I want you to watch what, what they do. Utah does uh, here off of play action. So now they're going to send him vertical again, single high look here. And he's just going to run that little Dino post right here, just inside uh, the safety there. Look at how quickly he gets vertically. Like in the, it's oh. so smooth, man. Yeah. And, and look at the post here and then catch right. Contested catch on a corner, mind you on a corner. He catches this again. You can do so many things, not just with his alignment, but with formations. And when you have a guy with his type of skill set, as you see here from the end zone angle, it just can be really fun as a coordinator. Cause look at him at the catch point guys. It's just unreal. Like go up and get it with a guy draped on him. He shrugs them off for the touchdown. Like I can't wait to see him in this, the bills offense. I just can't. This is a quarterback friendly play from Kincaid, which you'll see with regularity. And again, this is where having a bigger bodied guy with some arm length and some size and a bigger frame, like you can put that ball kind of off frame a little bit or off kilter and he can go up and make a play. Eric, this one though, my, my favorite piece is it or, or in this is something I've been talking about all off season. I talked about it a bit last night on disguise coverage. Like I just love what 12 personnel can be in these type of formations from a dictation piece. If the defense wants to stay in those two high linemen, cool. Guess what? Now we have the numbers advantage in the box and we can probably churn out a good, maybe six or seven yards and take it easy. Or you want to come and bring down somebody into the box and you want to be in single high. Cool. Now maybe we'll go play action and suck in your second level defenders and take advantage with our athletic tight end who is too big to be matched with corners but he's too fast and athletic to be matched by bigger linebackers or bigger safeties. You have this one-on-one -on -one individual mismatch potential in a vacuum, but you also have the dictation and mismatch potential formationally and from an alignment perspective. It's a really exciting piece, again, for the potential of what it could be. He opens up a lot of potential doors. Yeah, and just think about it. They are in that two-by-two -two set, 12 personnel. At a, at a blink of a hat, they could shift out into a two-by-two -two set like this, right? So you do, that's the stuff that the Patriots used to do so often to the Bills with Gronk and Hernandez. Um, and, and just that type of versatility is fantastic. So you saw that they were in a condensed set, you know, double tight set, single high stacked box. Well, now they have a two by two set. They're in a two high look, but guess what? He's good enough to work down the seam. You're, you're going to play cover two. Well, guess what? I'm going to just beat this, uh, linebacker over the middle right here and catch the ball Ridiculous. down the field. Just unreal. But again, so smooth working down the seam and splitting the defense right down the middle of the field and this too high look. So again, too high, you can, you're going to see some of those Y options. You're going to see some of those slot options, but you're also going to see a lot of these posts and corners, you know, smash type concepts to uh, work the middle of the field, work those honey holes, and when you have a guy that can go up and get the ball like this on a contested catch down the field, I mean, this is some unreal stuff. I mean, look at that catch. Oh, that's the catch radius right there. Like that's going up and getting it. This is where if it's a smaller guy, you have to put it more on his body or you have to hope that he has that, that ability to climb the ladder. This is, I don't want to overplay it too much, but this is kind of easy. Like he just reaches up and plucks it. Yeah, because he can. And again, this is where you, if you're going to see those two high looks from defenses, right? And you've got Stefan Diggs 
on the outside on one side, and you've got everyone's favorite wide receiver too, Gabe Davis on the other side. Yeah. Stephon Diggs has gravity. He's going to draw coverage. Gabe Davis, whether you like him or not, has proven in this league that he can win downfield. So if you're throwing those two high looks, right, are you going to take the chance that Diggs gets one-on-one -on, -one on the outside or Gabe Davis does, or do you want to take those safeties and kind of play them outside the hashes a little bit? Okay, cool. Do you have a linebacker that can carry Dalton Kincaid vertically? And with his athleticism and speed, or do you, is your athletic guy who can stay, stay with Kincaid that nickel corner? Cool. That nickel corner is going to get mossed in the middle of the field. That was a big bodied linebacker who Kincaid went up and took that up away from and on the top of his head. Imagine what he's going to do to a typical nickel corner in the, in the NFL. Yeah. And you see it here. He works uh, down the sideline and, you know, I talk about him always aligning into the short side of the field. They can do that with him because of his catch radius, because mm -hmm. of how well he tracks the ball, how well he catches the ball. Even when he's covered, he's open. And he, in many ways, extends the width of the field. So even though you have the ball in the right hash here, and again, you're in the short side of the field, he is able to extend the width of the field because he can not, not only play to the boundary with great boundary awareness, but he can go up and get it like he does here down the sideline. And so they used him like that in so many different ways. So you're going to see a lot of these you know, plays down the field where he's making these 50-50 balls when really they're 70-30 balls and, and bringing them in and still getting his feet in along the sideline there. Um, we talked about those, uh, you know, slot options and working him from the slot. Here he is. This is, you know, again, single high look. So whether you want to play two or one high, he can get down the field. Single high look. Hey, here's a shot call. Run that slot fade. And they do here. And he's able to, again, reel it in down the field in a contested catch situation. He even gets the flag on this play. Yeah. It's just, it's crazy because you'll, you'll see from the end zone angle right here, watch how the guy is really just driving him out of the, out of bounds. Like he's just got nothing left in the yeah. tank and he's still able to keep his eyes on the ball and reel it in for, for the catch there along the sideline. I love a good slot fade. Just I, I love sideline work, like a good rail route um, or a good wheel or a good slot fade. Kincaid is so prolific at the slot fade. And I love the 70, 30 ball. You talked about one of my favorite, you know, quotes from last season was T Higgins from the Bengals talking about, you know, when he's downfield, those 50, 50 balls are 80, 20 for him. And it's, it's real. Like he turns him into 80, 20 Kincaid is that guy who gives you that person who's a ball winner downfield because of his catch radius and frame and athleticism. Like here he is again, like slot piece gets vertical. There's some separation. Look how he goes up and he plucks it. This is the big thing I noticed. We, we, we showed it in the underneath routes when he caught it and transitioned to a ball carrier, look how he plucks the ball and he tucks it. He takes it and tucks it immediately. He doesn't get lazy with the ball. He doesn't just leave it in his hands. Almost every time he catches the ball, he catches it and he tucks it. It's Eric. It's like, we're back playing ball again. And you're working on the jugs gun and it's like catch and tuck, catch and tuck. And you flip the ball back. He again, credits his basketball background for that. You know, that ability to go up, get the ball, rip it away and tuck it underneath and protect it from other big, uh, big bodies when you're banging down low in the paint. It, it, it's just, it's technical, it's athletic, it's smooth, it's fluid, it's got mismatch potential, and the yeah. it is his skill set. Again, it's it's a really intriguing piece for so, so much of what we talked about, Eric, you mentioned it earlier, like to control the middle, what you needed from the slot. And we were thinking, man, if Jackson Smith and Jigba falls, or man, you know, Josh Downs in the second, or what could Zay Flowers be, and Tank Dell, and all these pieces. And they went out and got this power slot you know, yeah. the, the, this, this guy that gives you a formational mismatch potential in addition to just one-on-one -on -one mismatch potential in a vacuum, it's really exciting. Like, and again, we're not just saying it, like when you watch the tape and for Eric guys like us that think of the X's and O's and the scheme, it's just fun to kind of play with this in our head and think, mm -hmm. man, like, what could this be? Especially for a guy like Ken Dorsey, who yeah. you've shown in the last uh, several days, you know, his time in Carolina, the familiarity with the two tight end looks with Greg Olson mm -hmm. and Ed Dixon, even if you want to connect it back to his time as a player at the University of Miami with how much they use tight ends. Again, it was a bit of a different game of football back then, though that was more traditional, but maybe this potentially helps Ken Dorsey a little bit too. Oh, and it yeah. ties right into the slide. Yeah. 20, 2015. So the season that Ken Dorsey was the QB coach, Mike Shula, who is an assistant on the Bills staff right now under Ken Dorsey, they... Mike Shula was the OC, so now he's working under Dorsey. In 2015, when they made the Super Bowl, they were a 12 personnel team, so one running back, two tight ends on the field. And when they ran that, they ran it 
the most, 400, or second most, 437 plays in 2015. They scored 84 points in 12 personnel, over 2,600 yards. They were top five in EPA. Top, they were 10th in pass EPA. They were second in rush EPA. They are eighth in yards per play. I mean, they were just on top of the world when it came to, to 12 <laughs> personnel. So, again, at that time, Greg Olson was a premier weapon. They were targeting him like 25% mm-hmm. of the time. So, And he was a veteran, but, again, a first-round talent. Mm-hmm. All right? Ed Dixon was the second tight end in that offense, and uh, he was, I think, in his third or fourth year at the time. You can see the numbers by year. Um, off to the left side, the far left column uh, is just their snap percentage. Uh, and then you'll see the bill snap percentages. And then the, the third and fourth columns from um, from uh, the, the right side there, uh, you're going to see the slot percentages. So how mm-hmm. often uh, the Panthers use those guys in the slot during those years and then how much the bills have used their guys in the slot um, over the years. And so I do think that when it comes to Kincaid year one, I think he probably um, – does it gets a good chunk of a uh, snap percentage? I, mm-hmm. I'd say probably forty to fifty percent, um, and most of that is probably from the slot. Probably even higher to, than some of these guys. I, I imagine it probably be in like, um, let's see here. I'd probably go in with uh, Dixon's number fifty four point three percent snap percentage. I expect that number forty five to fifty percent uh, to be from the slot. So, you know, these are interesting numbers to look at just to give you an idea. Like, hey. Yes, the Bills haven't had the ability to run 12 personnel looks, but when the Panthers had those type of guys and their offensive identity was 12 personnel, those guys got a lot of work and a lot of targets. Absolutely. And I understand I I brought this a similar point like this up last night on this guy's coverage, and I understand the skepticism that fans do have regarding Ken Dorsey and some of the – the comments that came through were like, well, yeah, if Ken Dorsey knows how to use him, and you know, last year he couldn't use him, so we'll see. Last year's tight end grouping, no disrespect of Dawson Knox, Tommy Sweeney, and even Quentin Morris, Eric, who you know both yeah. you and I like. That's not a tight end grouping where you're looking at your roster going, man, we need to go more twelve personnel because we need to get Tommy Sweeney and Quentin Morris on the field more. It's a different <laughs> yeah. dynamic when you've got two tight ends who are functional in the pass game, but also as blockers versus the pass or in the pass and in the run. And that's what you had at that time in Carolina. Like Greg Olson was one of the premier tight ends in the league could almost do anything and everything. I still don't get why the Chicago bears traded him. I thought that was so foolish. I mean, I was playing 95% of the snaps. That's wild. wild. That is wild. And getting 25% of the targets. It's crazy to think that he, he was a stud. And the funny thing about, You know, some of the negatives with Dalton Kincaid kind of tie into some of the coaching stuff because some of the negatives are, you know, his blocking and mostly his blocking in line. It's inconsistent. Mm -hmm. Um, I think he's got the willingness to block, which is hugely important, right? Like, yeah, he's but blocking on the perimeter screens, pitches, stuff like that. He's money. I'm not even worried about that, especially when you're talking. He's gonna be going up against corners and safeties. But in line, there's some inconsistencies Mm -hmm. and it's really having to do with his physicality. But the funny thing is one Greg Olson had the same thing coming out. He was the same type of player who had to work on blocking. You know, he was almost, he was almost a pure pass catching tight end coming out of the university of Miami. And you know who his coach was in Chicago initially? I wonder, tell us Rob Boris, (gasps) Rob Boris helped develop Olson into a well-balanced tight end. Same with Dawson Knox coming out. You know, he wasn't the best blocker, but now he's functional and, yes, and more of absolutely. a plus blocker, not just on in, in the on the perimeter like uh, Kincaid, but also in line. And so mm-hmm. I can see this offense, you know, being more that power spread where Kincaid, again, maybe it's not year one, but he's going to be that slot role, that volume guy. And as we said, you know, when it comes to 12 uh, personnel, when it comes to tight ends, the bills can only go up. And that's a good thing. So that's a good thing. I I don't want everyone to be like, okay, you know, have your worries about Dorsey. I get that. But Dorsey has experience with guys like Dorsey, with like guys like Olsen and and tight ends like Dixon. Um, So I'm not too worried about that. And think about this. This is how I'll end this this segment. Last season, as, you know, as bad as the slot was and how they had to go back and get Cole Beasley, the reason why Kincaid is important in the slot is because even last year, with all that going on, the Bills were still fifth in percentage of targets from the slot position. Mm. So they still want to be a slot-based offense, which they always were under Beasley. 
They just need a guy to carry that torch. And Kincaid could be that guy. It, it, again, it's extremely exciting to see what he brings from a skill set piece. And um, just to, to, to round it out for me, you know, we talked about so much about the athleticism, the pass catching piece. I, I wanted to drill home again on, on the run blocking piece because, mm-hmm. you know, he is, his strength is as a pass catcher and his athleticism and the technicality and the fluidity. Yes. But just because his strength as a tight end is towards the pass catching side, that does not mean he's a poor or a minus run blocker, especially Eric. Like you said, you watch him on the tape. He can dig out safeties. He can crack on linebackers. He is money. Like you said, against slot corners and outside corners. Is he the guy that you want lined up in line blocking Matt Judon right now? No, not necessarily. But you know what? If that does happen, he's going to try his ass off. He's not going to shy away from contact. One of the comps I saw um, during the draft weekend that I hated, people were like, oh, so he's like a better Mike Gesicki. No, oh, no, that's Mike disrespectful. Is- that's Absolutely. straight. Because that guy was allergic to block, and that yes. is straight disrespectful. Yes, he cannot block, and he does not want to block. Mike Gesicki, no. for all intents and purposes, all like tight end versus weapon versus slot receiver, all those jokes aside – Mike Kosicki is a slot receiver. He is not a tight end. He does not attempt to block. He does not want to. None of it. Kincaid is functional and he's willing. And that is at this point good enough considering how much of a plus matchup and pass catcher he is when you look at the tight end position. So all in all, a move that, you know, I think surprised a lot of us on draft night, but was really exciting to see, um, you know, especially when we started thinking about it and really diving into the tape. 